I have a confession. Bless me, Gary, for I have sinned. I am no longer vegan. TM. <laughs> oh, God. Think of all the money that Nestle could have made from me. Won't somebody please think of the CEOs? Well, now I'm only vegan as a deeply political stance against the commodity status of animals fighting for total human and animal liberation. Oh, who's that gonna help? You see, when I first entered this movement, all of these slim, beautiful, bohemian, chic white women told me that I could save the animals by eating lots of fruit and veg and choosing vegan burgers and ice cream instead of non-vegan ones. I also learned quickly that there is simply no justifiable reason of any kind to not consume 100% perfectly vegan at all times, and that an important part of vegan activism is to police other people's veganism and direct all of my rage and trauma over what's happening to the animals to tearing down other people who aren't consuming perfectly. Because they are of course bad people, and my consumer choices make me unequivocally good, moral, righteous. But alas, no more. You see, although I still believe it is important to consume vegan as much as is possible and practicable, I simply understand political economy and I can't unlearn what I have learned. So I'm going to share just a bit of that with you today and if you find yourself agreeing with me, you just may want to join me in dropping that TM off the end of your vegan activism as well. And if you're watching this and you're not vegan or even vegan TM and you find yourself agreeing, you may just want to adopt veganism into to your political praxis. So let's start with a vegan TM approach. How successful has individualist consumer-based vegan activism been in ending animal suffering over the past several decades? As most plant-based news will tell you, veganism is on the rise, hell yeah! There are more vegan products on the market now than there have ever been. But oops, uh-oh, what's this? Global meat production and consumption continue to rise. We're killing more animals today than we ever have before, with the FAO expecting meat production to double by 2050. And this number has already tripled in the past 40 years. But what about all this cashew cheese I'm buying? So you're telling me that more vegans and more vegan products has not meant less animals being bred into the system and slaughtered? Animals are not being liberated? Kind of a kick in the pants as someone who used to love sharing those vegan memes about how many animals I had personally saved in a year by not contributing to non-vegan industries. Okay, so we haven't been able to make a dent in animal suffering on the whole, but surely if we just get enough people to consume properly, we'd be able to achieve a sustainable, cruelty-free, compassionate world, right? Well, let's consider some of the inherent contradictions involved in consumer-based activism. Number one, both vegan and non-vegan industries can grow at the same time. Turns out this is not actually a zero-sum game, but pretty normal in a capitalist economy based on perpetual growth. Making vegan consumerism profitable does not equal making meat production unprofitable. Number two, maybe we should consider the contradictions inherent in the capitalist system itself since it seems to be facilitating the growth in meat production despite the rise in vegan consumption. The first contradiction, the contradiction of overaccumulation, is that any given market over time will become oversaturated. People will no longer be buying what you're selling, or in a bid for profits, capitalists will have put a downward pressure on wages, benefits, etc. so that people can no longer afford what is being sold. A great example of this is that we actually produce 1.5 times enough food to feed everyone on the planet. It is just not being distributed because people cannot afford it. Food is a commodity, not a social right. It is actually more cost effective to waste 40% of the food that we produce instead of distributing it to hungry people. So we are not actually living in a situation of scarcity, but rather scarcity is artificially produced. So understanding this contradiction, let's think of some of the reasons why people can't necessarily always access 100% perfect consumption all the time. As much as vegans like to say that veganism is accessible in any budget, this is certainly not always the case, and there are many intersecting structural reasons why 100% perfectly pure consumption is not possible for everyone all the time. Instead of denying this reality, vegans who want to see more people accessing vegan products and plant-based lifestyles would do well to understand these structural barriers and seek to dismantle them. For example, structural racism and class-based oppression lead to the proliferation of food deserts, which predominantly affect low-income communities and communities of racialized minorities. 23.5 million people live in urban neighborhoods and rural towns with limited access to fresh, affordable, healthy food. In the U.S. alone, 2.1 million households 
individuals do not own a vehicle and live more than one mile from the nearest grocery store. Low-income zip codes have 30% more convenience stores, which tend to lack healthy items, than middle-income zip codes. People of the poorest socioeconomic status have 2.5 times the exposure to fast food restaurants compared to those living in the wealthiest areas. Not typically a ton of great vegan products there. Buying whatever you like at any time does not reflect the experience of millions of people. And we can't actually address this problem without addressing structural racism, gentrification, and capital flight, and the corporate food regime. As well, there has been wage stagnation since the 1970s when neoliberal economic reforms swept the globe and tried to free markets in the interests of capital. Labor share of the output of profits has declined significantly. Jobs were outsourced and increasingly they are being automated. So even if laborers unionize and demand better working conditions, there's always the threat that the company will just outsource further or simply automate. We're looking at a future where labor has less and less power and relevance with respect to capital. And you can only vote with your dollars if you have adequate dollars, something that will likely not be a reality for most much longer as we increasingly need to rely on UBI just to make the system work. And the people with the most dollars get the most votes. Hello meat and dairy lobby. So, okay. Let's imagine that voting with your dollar is not a problem, and everyone is free to consume vegan goods all the time and self-righteously call their consumption habits cruelty-free. Remembering that vegans typically advocate veganism for health, for the planet, and for the animals, let's see how much headway can be made in any of these three categories by simply consuming vegan and not challenging the broader social, political, or economic structures. Number one, conglomerates. Capital tends to concentrate into fewer and fewer hands, and so even if you are purchasing a vegan product, that company is likely owned by a broader non-vegan conglomerate, and your vegan product is just one avenue for profit among many non-vegan ones. haagen ice cream, for example, which has many great vegan options, is owned by Nestle. For one, Nestle is infamous for water privatization around the world, for example, draining Lake Michigan while Flint doesn't have any clean water. But further, the chocolate that the company uses is among the most unethical available. It's sourced from West Africa, particularly the Côte d'Ivoire, and its harvesting relies heavily on child labor. A lawsuit in California implicates Nestle in trafficking children, trafficking Malian children to the Côte d'Ivoire to work on cocoa farms. Sounds cruelty-free to me, let's give them our money. How about Chick-fil-A? You know, that homophobic company whose CFO has opposed same-sex marriages and which donates money to foundations that are hostile to LGBTQ rights and a company which also kills many animals, yeah, let's fill up their pockets to show that we demand more vegan products like the vegan salad they've just released. Boy, ethical consumption is tricky, y'all. Chocolate? Palm oil? Quinoa? And what about industrial agriculture in general? You know, the one that furnishes most people in the West with their fruits and veggies too? They're known for their sustainability and great labor practices too, right? A Foodie's Guide to Capitalism, which I've talked about before, looks at the utter unsustainability of this corporate food model. Commercial agriculture was tied to the dawn of capitalism with the Enclosure Acts and primitive accumulation. It quickly concentrated land into fewer and fewer hands, emptying people from the countrysides and sending them into the cities to become poor laborers. Monsanto, bought out by Bayer, dangerously controls the majority of our food. Huge monocrops have disrupted the nutrient cycle, and pesticides are harming our soil. Scientific American reported that we only have 60 years of farming left if things continue apace. And some of the most dangerous pesticides, neonicotinoids, are killing off all of our pollinators pollinators that we need for the continuation of our entire food system. Does it make sense as a vegan to not consume honey, but then consume vegetable products that have been grown with pesticides that are killing off all the pollinators? If your first thought is, oh, no problem, I'll just buy local organic all the time, I will refer you back to the accessibility discussion. And of course, capitalism turns what would typically be problems for its continuation into new avenues of profit and growth. So there's an exciting new pollinator service industry that involves trucking around thousands and thousands of bees to be let out to pollinate the crops that we need them to. You know, things they used to do normally for free. I actually did a podcast about this with the incredible Becky Ellis from the Permaculture for the People podcast, so you should check that out. But a great example of this is the almonds in California. Vegan TM activists think that they're contributing to bee liberation by not eating honey, but overlook these important connections and ultimately the systems that are driving them. For example, an activist that is out there actively fighting against neonicotinoids, but who occasionally consumes products that may have honey in them, 
is not vegan. I'm not saying it's okay to just go around and consume products that harm animals willy-nilly, but that there is so much more activism that needs to be done, and policing activists on their consumption patterns within these broader contexts is not only self-defeating, but hypocritical. Our capitalist food system is expansionary in nature, and so it will never be sustainable even if everyone adopts a vegan diet. This is not a system that will allow for the flourishing of humans and animal populations simultaneously. And what about straight-up consumer goods? How many of you have cell phones? Do you think that those are cruelty-free? Do you know how the cobalt is being mined in the Congo by children? How they are dying working in dangerous conditions as the earth is polluted? How the US military has staged coups there and installed violent dictators that would allow them to continue controlling the resource? Are we not doing harm by purchasing these? Are these products not damaging to animals and their ecosystems? Again, this is not to say that industries that cage and exploit and violently harm sentient animal bodies are not abhorrent and traumatizing and should be completely avoided, but bigger picture please. And I know that many vegans are anti-consumerist, they are minimalist that intent on buying as little as possible, but ironically, within this broader capitalist framework, if people aren't buying, you'll be in crisis, the system will stagnate, jobs will be lost, and people will probably struggle to afford those vegan products that they take for granted now. The necessity for growth encourages the creation of false demands. So if we're going to fight consumerism, we have to take aim at the broader economic framework that drives it. So there are innumerable people who are making incredible connections between speciesism and racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, etc., including my BFF and podcast co-host, A Privileged Vegan. Check her out. So I've linked a bunch of resources in the description box below, which I can go into in a future video if people are interested. But today I'm just going to touch on a few ways that treating veganism as merely a consumption list can facilitate other forms of oppression within the movement. Number one. Vegan Nazis! There are Nazis in the vegan TM movement, and therefore highly anti-Semitic rhetoric. They are often not even vegan for the animals, but rather for purity of blood and superiority. They think Hitler was a vegetarian, which he was not. Check out my podcast. But there are many vegans who will say that we shouldn't call this stuff out because that's being divisive. Leave your politics at the door. This is just about the animals. And at the end of the day, it's just really great to have as many people consuming properly as possible. This is of course facilitated by a mainstream TM movement focused on consumption and also identity. Anti-Semitism also feeds into upholding global capitalism, which is destroying the planet and the animals and marginalizing people the world over. A lot of anti-Semitic rhetoric is used to blame Jews for the contradictions of capitalism itself, and fascism is of course just capitalism on steroids. So cruelty-free, compassionate, liberatory? Many vegans will also condemn indigenous traditional livelihoods as being oppressive to animals which is entirely inappropriate as settlers who brought animal agriculture to North America through colonization. Animal agriculture was actually a tool of colonial territorialization because it allowed for the controlling of large swaths of land and the centralization of food control. This displaced First Nations from their homelands and destroyed their food security. For First Nations in the North in particular, not much food can be actually cultivated. As well, traditional livelihoods that see humans as integral parts of their ecosystems are very far removed from the kind of captivity and mutilation and oppression that goes on in the animal agriculture industry. And vegan washing is really apartheid. We actually have a podcast about this also with the incredible Laura Schleifer, which you can check out. But much like pink washing and art washing, the Israeli state is using veganism to whitewash their brutal colonial occupation and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. You can have vegan army boots, vegan berets, and vegan meals in the IDF so that you can march out and massacre Palestinians, destroy their homes, and bomb their schools and their school children, knowing that no innocent animal has been harmed in the provisioning of those items. Shamefully, lots of vegan influencers have been ignoring BDS and going on tours there, participating in this vegan washing. Many came back and admitted that they did not actually know what was going on politically, but others will just say, well, you know, this is just about the animals. Once again, leave politics out the door. For an example of the intersections of differing oppressions like racism and speciesism, we can look at the prison industrial complex, which is also a 
private for-profit industry that contracts out slave labor. Inmates in Colorado, for example, paid cents on the dollar per hour, are milking cows and goats and filleting fish and harvesting honey, with a lot of these products ending up in places like Whole Foods. As well, POC neighborhoods and communities are often targeted for the siting of new slaughterhouses. This is environmental racism and environmental injustice because being situated next to a slaughterhouse comes with the most incredible risks to public health and safety. As I said, I have way more resources about these interconnections below, but we can see that the exploitation of humans and the environment and animals are often inextricably linked and that human liberation is often inseparable from animal liberation. So today I'm arguing for veganism as a political stance and not merely a grocery list. As a political stance, veganism rejects the commodity status of animals. Animals are here with us, not for us, and as autonomous sentient beings with agency and with bodily autonomy, they should be respected as such. As I just touched upon, animals are our comrades. They have a stake in dismantling colonial capitalism. They have a stake in opposing the prison industrial system and systemic racism. As a political stance, veganism also rejects speciesism, which is a system of marginalization that deems certain lives to be less than, similar to patriarchy, capitalism, and racism. Speciesism is institutional discrimination and individual prejudice against non-human animals based on their species. It is violence against non-human animals perpetrated by the privileged human species, usually for the benefit of humans. Speciesism not only divides humans from animals, but also sets up hierarchies within the animal kingdom itself. So you have animals that we love and adore and that we welcome into our homes and treat like family, like dogs and cats and companion animals. We have animals that we loathe and we view as pests and want to exterminate, like pigeons, like rats, etc. We have animals that we are in awe of, that we find beautiful and exotic, and we don't necessarily welcome them into our homes, but we want to protect them somewhere out there. And we have classes of animals that we deem it okay to cage, to keep in tiny, confined, horrible conditions, never seeing the sun, never stepping outside. We deem it okay to breed them for specific traits that we want, traits that actively harm their health and their ability to have mobility. We deem it okay to rip their babies away from them, treating them all as just commodities. There are a lot of people, sadly, who will be very up in arms against the Yulin Dog Festival in China while simultaneously consuming meat products from this animal agriculture industry with just total cognitive dissonance. So as a political stance, people who believe in animal liberation, who are against speciesism, will incorporate veganism into their lives as much as is possible and practicable. This will look different for everyone based on a variety of factors, socioeconomic factors, political factors, for example, but also personal issues in terms of your relationship to food, perhaps, or health issues that you're going through. Does this mean that we can all just consume animal products and that that should be our default setting? No, absolutely not. We should do this as much as is possible and practical, but it does mean that purity politics are not useful. And it also means that there is so much more activism that needs to be done. I was recently on the Horror Vanguard podcast, shout out, check that out. And we watched this film called Raw. And we were talking about how what's really behind so many systems of domination and oppression, and especially what's behind carnism, is this disrespect for the bodily autonomy of other sentient beings. Patriarchy, capitalism, racism, etc. They violate people's autonomy. They prevent them from being truly self-determining people for greed, for power, for pleasure. Vegan anarchist scholars will argue that carnism is the gateway drug into other forms of oppression. Once you learn how to oppress one, it becomes easy to dehumanize and oppress others. Af and Silco in their book Aphorism talk about this animalization of different groups of marginalized people, where the higher you go on the hierarchy, the more you are humanized, and the lower you go in the hierarchy, the more you are animalized, dehumanized, and therefore easier to marginalize. Another example of these interconnections is Holocaust technologies, which drew a lot from animal agriculture, 
And then, consequently, animal agriculture drew a lot from Holocaust technologies. Arguably, we cannot have human liberation if we are continuing to oppress animals and vice versa. So even though consumer-based activism is limited, I'm going to end with some reasons to still consume vegan as much as is possible and practicable right now before the revolution. Number one, it's just very important not to contribute to this industry. Individual choices are not going to solve climate change, but the best individual choice you can make to cut your carbon emissions in half would be to go vegan. As well, if we understand that animal agriculture is inherently unsustainable and that it's completely inefficient to be the secondary consumer, and that if we want to actually create a post-capitalist, post-scarcity environment, animal agriculture will have to be drastically reduced if not left by the wayside, then it's very important to start making those changes now, to prefigure that world that we want to see, to make sure that we know how to live and feed ourselves in ways that aren't going to be contributing to these horrible industries. Number two, you wouldn't really be super lax about other social movements, so feminism for example. Even though we know that capitalist structures exacerbate sexism, we aren't going to then say, well, until the revolution, I'm just still going to participate in rape culture and then ending capitalism will just fix the whole thing. Because frankly, I am not convinced that if people are unwilling to make any changes now, that the minute we have some kind of alternative political economy, people are going to wake up and say, hmm, okay, I've gone vegan immediately. I'm vegan right now. I do not see that happening. So number three, tied to that, it's important to start dismantling speciesism within ourselves right now. It's important to start thinking about the kind of relationships that we want to have with animals and with the environments that we live in when we create a new and better world. And if we aren't willing to think about that now, if we aren't willing to make any changes to our way of acting in the world now, then again, uh, I don't see that happening post-revolution in some magical way. So hopefully that was food for thought for everyone. If you would like to support the continuation of these videos, tossing me even $1 per month via Patreon really goes a long way. I have to eat in this economy. Very special shout out to my existing patrons. I appreciate you so much. Special shout out to Derp Derpington, Garfield Feet, Null Style, and Stefan Wolfler. Check out my podcast at Vegan Vanguard podcast.com. Connect with me on Facebook and Twitter. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in another video.